Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Justin Waldman. He, him. I am the, one of the Associate Artistic Directors here at the Old Globe. And we are so uh, honored to, welcome, to you, welcome you all tonight to tonight's Vicki and Carl Zeiger Insight Seminar for Dial M for Murder. <laughs> I'm using my props. Um, uh, we are so grateful to have these two amazing gentlemen to my right here this evening. We have the, the adapter and playwright, Jeffrey Hatcher, Hello. and the, yes, <laughs> and the director of the show, Stafford Arima. It's, uh, it's really, I, I usually only have one guest, so now I'm feeling outnumbered. Um, uh, but uh, uh, as, as per usual, what I'd like to do is uh, uh, embarrass these two gentlemen a little bit by talking about the amazing things that they have done, and then we'll just jump in and start talking about the show. Is that all right? All right. Uh, I'm going to start with Jeffrey because he's right here. Uh, this is Jeffrey's fifth show at the Old Globe. Uh, he started here, the first show was in 1998 with Scotland Road, where he also did complete, oh, yes. We have a fan. Uh, uh, complete female stage beauty, smash, and lucky duck. Um, uh, in those, that was a good show. Uh, yeah. All right, for applause for all of those shows. Yes, very well. <laughs> Well it's only a small many a small bit of his oeuvre, though, but his plays and ad adaptations include Broadway's Never Gonna Dance, A Picasso, Turn of the Screw, Tuesdays with Maury, The Government Inspector, A Confederacy of Dunces, Mrs. Mannerly, which I love, by the way, oh, um, ma and many, many others. <laughs> and they've been seen all across the country, the Geffen, the Guthrie, the Huntington, everywhere in between in the entire country. Um, and uh, he's also written many films, including Stage Beauty, an adaptation of his play, Mr. Mr. Holmes in The Good Liar, amongst others, and wrote for TV's Columbo and The Mentalist. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Um, his, he has many awards and grants, including the National Endowment for the Arts, a MacArthur Fellowship, the McKnight Foundation, the Jerome Foundation, the Barrymore Award for Best New Play, and a wow. Ivy Award for Lifetime Achievement. Wow. Uh, I can die now. <laughs> <laughs> He is a prince of a man. Oh, He's wow. so kind. And if you listen closely tonight in the play, you will hear his actual voice oh. in the show. So he is an uncredited actor. Yeah. So right. Jeffrey Un Hatcher. Unpaid, too. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Stafford Arima is our director of the show. This is Stafford's fourth show at the Old Globe. Uh, he directed Ace, Red Velvet, and Allegiance. Um, wow. Yes. And Allegiance was just usurped as the highest grossing show in the history of the Globe by Almost Famous a couple years ago. So he held the title for <laughs> almost a decade, which is really impressive. Um, his directing credits include Allegiance on Broadway, Ragtime on the West End, which he was nominated for an Olivier Award for, and the off-Broadway productions of Alter Boys, Carrie, and Secret Garden, Jock Briel, Tin Pan Alley Rag, and Regionally, and a lot of amazing places, including he was just up the road at La Jolla Playhouse with Bang in It, uh, which many of you have seen. <clears throat> The Good Speed, Stafford, the Stratford Festival in Canada, and Paper Mill Playhouse, among many other great institutions across this country and in the, the country above us, where he is the artistic director of Theatre Calgary uh, in Calgary and Ber Alberta, Canada, one of the largest and most recognizable institutions, arts institutions in Canada. And they're very lucky to have such a loving and kind leader. And I just have to say that Stafford is one of the most amazing human beings that I've had the pleasure to work with in my time here at the Globe. There is nobody that brings more love into a room than this man. So everybody, Stafford Arima. <laughs> See, I said I would embarrass you. So um, We're not embarrassed, we're tickled. <laughs> <laughs> so I guess the, the first question, Jeffrey, is why adapt Dial M for Murder? Well, that's what I said to Barry Edelstein. <laughs> um, and can you hear me all okay? All right. But Maybe move closer. To so um, I, can, I can just I can do my Frank Sinatra. <laughs> uh, so Barry called me two and a half years ago, and he said, "What do you think about adapting Dial M for Murder?" And uh, I'd already adapted another play written by the author of Dial M for Murder, Frederick Knott. I'd done Wait Until Dark up at the Geffen. So and and. You know, I know the play very well. I know Dial M very well. 
Um, and if I could, I, I used to think of myself as an actor. If I could have been an actor, I'd want to play the killer, the husband in Dial M for Murder. You know, they go, what do you mean, Inspector? By surely I couldn't have killed her. Um, I like that kind of acting. Uh, so I, you know, and I th think Dial M for Murder is pretty much a perfect play. So, but I don't want to turn down work. And Barry <laughs> said, well, I think we could find a few other plot changes in it. Maybe uh, the female character, the role that Grace Kelly played in the movie, could get uh, another look. And he said, what about the lover? And uh, I don't know if you know the, the player of the film well, but if you know the film, the lover is played by Robert Cummings. And Barry said, well, what if Robert Cummings wasn't Robert Cummings? <laughs> what if Robert Cummings was some other kind of person entirely? And I, I leave that hazy because you haven't seen the show. So that was Barry's idea. And I said, all right, let me see if I can run with it. And, he, and then the other, the, the other uh, stipulation was, oh, and we want to do it in the round. <laughs> <laughs> and, well, those of you who laugh understand that murder mysteries are kind of best played in proscenium houses. <laughs> There's something about the framing of it and being able to see the doors. And Barry said, yeah, we won't have any doors or anything like that. <laughs> so, oddly enough, a lot of Stafford, my work, has been making that work in the round. Um, and, and sometimes it's, it's little technical things here and there, and sometimes it's conceptual. Um, but I think, it, I, you know, dare I say, I think it does work well in the round. And uh, we were all set to do it two and a half years ago, and then we got closed down by the pandemic. But we're very glad to be here now, and we've got a terrific cast, and it seems to be doing gangbusters. So we hope you enjoy it tonight. Mm -hmm. Uh, excellent. So can you can you talk a little bit about your role as an adapter? So taking the piece that it, that Knopp wrote and then how you how much do you use? How much do you throw out? What is what is your flourishes? What are the things that you have to keep sure. clearly in there? Uh, 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 you know, Justin gave me a very nice uh, uh, opening bio. And from it, you can tell I do a lot of adap adaptations. And I think the first rule of an adaptation is don't screw up what already works really well. <laughs> and, you know, with Frederick Knott, who, who was a very, he was pre precision clock timing when it came to plot. You know, you don't want to screw around with that stuff. I mean, that you leave alone. However, I think there's a lot of room to maneuver in terms of characterization, character background, the characters themselves at all. So if you get into there, it's almost like translation work. You know, you can give people different backgrounds. You can give them different motivations as long as they still walk in this door and try to kill somebody at the same time. <laughs> so there's like a macro that you that you leave alone because Knott was very good. And I, I, uh, I got in touch with Harvard that has the Frederick Knott papers, and I was able to read various drafts of Dial M. And how many of you uh, know a vague history of it? Because it's an interesting history. Okay, so... It was written as a television play first. So the first time anybody saw it was a live broadcast in the early 50s with Morris Evans and all that. Morris Evans is, as, as the, the, the bad guy. And then it was a, a play in the West End and on Broadway. And then it was a movie. But if you track it back even further, you can find various drafts. He works on it for seven years. And you can see him try different endings, different buttons or pops, you know, how the killer is arrested, how he, you know. And it's kind of fascinating to watch his, his brain over the course of seven years. It has a famous ending, you know, if the killer does X, you know, we'll catch him. <laughs> but it's there in an early draft in 1947, but it hasn't become the ending. It's simply there as a as a clue, and then you see about four years later, five years later, suddenly it becomes the main clue. So it's a little like somebody looking at a picture develop and saying, yes, that's the detail that I should focus on. And, you know, that's, that kind of writing is really hard to do. Um, so again, wouldn't screw around with that <laughs> if my life depended on it. <laughs> but it still does leave you, a one of the things I like most is that, um, after the first draft, and you know, you always have to get the estate to say yes. So uh, Barry and everybody in the, you know, business-wise, 
had to get the Frederick Knott estate to say, okay, we're willing to look at this, but we get to read the play and tell you if we hate it. <laughs> and uh, Frederick Knott's son, who was, I believe, a dentist on Long Island, read it, <laughs> and he really dug it, you know? So, uh, so that makes me feel good. That we do, you, you don't want to take a play and adapt it and argue with it, you know what I mean? Um, you can add to it, you can subtract, but you don't want to say, I don't like this play and that's why I'm, I'm changing it. Mm -hmm. So I hope we simply, um, you know, given Dilemma for Murder a little, what would you say? Not testosterone? What's the opposite? <laughs> zhuzh. Zhuzh. <laughs> Stanford always uses the technical term zhuzh. <laughs> So, Severin, can you, can you talk a little bit about what that juge is for you? Like, because there, it's such a stylistic piece, and like to capture that style in theater is is there takes a lot of zhuzhing to make that happen. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think the one of the the greatest gifts of this adaptation is exactly what you know Jeffrey talked about, which is when you have such a great kind of piece, the bones of the piece are there. And what Jeffrey has done so miraculously is zhuzhed it up uh, <laughs> and made it beautifully relevant, even though it still takes place in 1950s, beautifully relevant uh, and has captured a, a kind of zest for character that transcends anything that feels kind of like dusty. You know, it's like an old play and we're picking it off the shelf, dusting it off much more than a dusting. And so when a director is given the task of bringing something to life that has the magic and the sparkle and the zhuzh, we turn, directors, to uh, the great gifts of design. And we have such an incredible design team here from Broadway, locally, who have come to the Globe and have put their zhuzh on this material. And what does that mean? Well, it means how do you use lighting? And not just lighting that's like, well, we want to make sure we see the character, but how do we use lighting as a means of another character in the piece? How do we use sound, music, uh, and all of those incredible design elements that can give the piece just a little extra kind of sexiness? And not in the literal sense of sexiness, but just have it that much more stylized. Then you have a group of five incredible thespians, these actors, who have come to this work and have found a style of acting that is maybe reminiscent of something that we all think about when you watch an old 50s uh, film, but they've also found something very contemporary and today. And it's this interesting hybrid of something that feels traditional, but also something that feels modern, that I think gives the piece a, a, just another element of pizzazz and energy uh, that is not the original, and we didn't want it to be the original. Jeffrey's adaptation is not the original. It is, it is a brand new adaptation that just really soars off the page, and we hope the stage as well. <laughs> You know, one of the tricky things, and uh, Stafford alludes to it, I think, is, you know, a play like Dylan for Murder, like Death Trap or Sleuth, or and then there were none, are confections. Even though people are murdered sometimes in brutal <laughs> ways, they are nonetheless artificial. Why? Because they are uh, contraptions that end properly and make us happy. Right? <laughs> They're not episodes of Law and Order or something like that where it's ragged. And, and, and so to, to, to straddle that line between style and, and, re, and I guess we'd call it reality, it's like, <clears throat> why do people commit murder? You know, there are real reasons to commit murder, and they tend to be kind of horrible reasons. <laughs> you know, they're either very cold or they're very bloody. And what I think uh, is, is wonderful here is that I, I never thought that we would have as antic or as a, a live set as we have, because we're in the round, right? You will see a set that is, you know, because of the combination of, of, of set design and lighting, 
much more alive than I thought it could possibly be, but in a way that says um, this is this is a show, right? But never forget why people try to kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> and what actually is so, I think, brilliant in the fact that we are doing this in the round is that we actually, you know, there are five characters on stage, six if you consider all of the designers, seven including all of you. Because you are in the round, you are watching, you are observing, you are eavesdropping in on this murder mystery, and all of the characters on that stage, even though they know they're not performing at the O Globe, there is a sense of who's watching, who's listening. Every one of these characters is aware of that kind of out, outer eye that's kind of looking in on them. So to perform a murder mystery in the round, challenging as it may be, is also really exhilarating because you all become in so many ways participants uh, in the kind of events that, that transpire over the evening. <clears throat> Excellent. Yeah, it, like I, I <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I was going to say, Jeffrey, like you were trying to hold back a little bit of something, uh, a, a reveal in the yeah, show. Yeah, yeah. But like a lot of a lot of the reason that people come to our insight seminars is to get some insight oh, that see. they uh, may not have uh, known before. So I would love it if we could talk about that, if that's OK by you. Well, I will allude to it in this sense. You know, <laughs> it's a climate change year and there's been a lot of hot stuff in Europe. And there was a fire on the Isle of Lesbos. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think some of you just got it. Yes. <laughs> uh, the uh, well, that's uh, it's an interesting point insofar as this cast has one woman more than the original cast had. So that probably tells <clears throat> you a lot, which suddenly makes everything more, more contemporary. But at the same time. It, you know, the, the quote-unquote love that dare not speak its name could speak it less in 1953 than it can in 2022. So you won't be terribly surprised. You'll learn it pretty fast in the show. <laughs> uh, in fact, you can nudge your audience mates and say, you know, I went to the thing before, <laughs> and this show has lesbians. <laughs> uh, but... But, but, you know, and, and this is, again, the thing about the bones and the center of the original play. Frederick Knott's original play always had a love story at its center, but I think most productions, including the original ones and the film versions, emphasized murder, 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 plot, plot, plot. Mm -hmm. Well, we don't de-emphasize <clears throat> that, but we also emphasize a few other things. Mm -hmm. So... Um, is that enough to say yeah, about no, that? Cause, yeah, because what I wanted to set up, the question I wanted to set up really um, is the idea, I find myself so moved at the end of it because of the relationship between the, the, between the women, like that it's, and as a director setting up like the stakes of what that means and how important that is and, and how they really do love each other. So I was intrigued, like, in, in, in something that you talk about as a confection, like how the reality of that grounds it in such a way to help build the stakes. Is that... Yeah, it, it, I, I think, you know, when one says you're, you're going to direct Dial M for murder, uh, you know, what, it, what is the play about? And as, you know, Jeffrey said, oh, it's a murder. It's about, it, you know, it, it's, it's about revenge. And on the first day of rehearsals, I shared with the cast uh, that, to me, this is a love story. And one might go, well, love story? That doesn't make any sense. People are getting <laughs> murdered. It makes no sense. But what that allowed us to understand is that there are human beings up on that stage, characters that aren't archetypes. You know, you can kind of think, oh, well, in comes the inspector. And there's, a, there's an archetype or a trope that we all know what the inspector looks like, sounds like. But what this production allows, uh, because of the adaptation, is to find three-dimensionality within these characters. So if the expectation is I'm coming in to see a kind of facsimile of the movie with a kind of 1950s style of acting, most people would be disappointed. 
because that is not, the, the goal was never to do a kind of replica of the movie. It was to take the spirit of the film and the spirit of the style of the 50s and translate it into a kind of a contemporary lens through Jeffrey's adaptation, but give, give these characters a little more resonance. So it's not just, you know, kind of archetypes who are up there playing the damsel in distress, <laughs> you know, or the villain, the bad guy. Um, we want to feel for characters, yes? We want, to, we want to be able to, in a strange way, connect with them. And what we've realized, and it's probably part of the success of this piece in general, is people start rooting in a weird way for the, the, the bad guy. <laughs> and, 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 it's, and it's amazing how people are kind of fascinated by how this villain or the bad guy kind of pivots his way through this story. Um, you know, murder mysteries and traditions are all about a who done it. We know who did it in the first basically 10 minutes of the show. So what keeps you invested? It's a question to even ask yourself after you, you experience the play is what held me for those two hours? What kept me invested? It, it, it's kind of interesting. If you go all the way back to uh, at least the Hitchcock film uh, uh, and, and before, D a Dial M is the probably most famous version of what we would call the inverted murder mystery, uh, wherein you see the murder committed and you know who the killer is and all that. Columbo made that into yeah. its weekly thing. You meet the murderer of the week, <laughs> you see the murder, and 20 minutes in, that's when Columbo shows up. <laughs> but here... Uh, it's fascinating that that uh, you you do root for the murderer because you're put in his POV, and then you get a switch into well now you're in the victim's POV, and now you're in somebody else's POV, and it's basically I think our desire for things not to be messy, mm. that we want things to be. It's like in in Psycho, <laughs> there after Janet Lee is killed. Then Tony Perkins comes in, and there's a really long scene where he cleans up the murder and gets rid of the body, which puts us on Tony Perkins' side. <laughs> and it's, it's, I, I, I think it's great to be manipulated in the theater. <laughs> I mean, I, there's nothing I like better than going to a play or a film where I don't know the ending and I'm well <laughs> manipulated. But, th but that's what Knott did kind of brilliantly. Um, the, to find the, the level of manipulation so that when the, the killer is caught, you're both glad and disappointed. <laughs> Interestingly <laughs> enough, uh, Hitchcock wanted Cary Grant to play the killer. And Cary Grant just couldn't face the idea of playing a killer. <laughs> and so Ray Milan played it beautifully, you know. <laughs> but it's interesting when an actor says, no, I can't play the killer, you know. And I, I think you, you lose something when you don't want to play the bad guy. <laughs> Those are the juicy parts. Exactly. It's like Richard <laughs> III or Hedda Gobbler. Why wouldn't yeah. you want to play that? <laughs> <laughs> you both in the, the, your last comments kind of mentioned what I would call like the specter of the movie. Yes, like that there's a lot of expectations. Every, a lot of it's very well known. Like how do you address that in the putting the, putting together? Are there times that it's easier to lean in? Is it time mm -hmm. to, as you say, to manipulate with it? Like someone's, someone's uh, preconceived notion of what they might see. Can you use that? as a weapon before or against them? Yes, that's right. Go ahead. I think it's, that's more your territory. Well, I, I, it, I think the easiest answer and the most obvious is that we're not in a movie theater, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, you're experiencing the piece in the round. That in itself kind of turns everything kind of upside down. Three, you have an adaptation of the work, so it's not, it's not the same. And four, you allow an audience to kind of come in, perhaps with a little bit of expectation here and there. And my job is for in the first really three minutes of a play to erase that movie from your head instantly. <laughs> and and we'll see. Well, if I see you after the show, you can tell me, did, did we erase the, the kind of memory of what that play is? And that, that, that technique is used, um, one, through casting, Who's, who you see on that stage, two, lighting, sound, uh, and um, 
obviously the text, which again is different than the film. Mm -hmm. But but you know by the same token I think you had, and we had discussions about this in casting, you can make a mistake by trying to go too far away from the original. So let's say the killer we decided to cast as a giant football star mm -hmm. who talks mm -hmm. like this, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean that'd just be crazy, right? <laughs> so you know there are times when we lean towards uh, something that you would connect with. There's a famous bit in the film that I think is. I, I laugh at it now, but it, it's Grace Kelly uh, uh, on trial. And it's a huge close-up of her with lights changing behind her while you hear, you know, you are charged with, you are found guilty, you are sentenced <laughs> to death. <laughs> and it looks really old-fashioned and weird now. Stafford has a moment in, in the play, though, that kind of touches base with that, but isn't that. So in, in, I think, a strange way, not a strange way, but in, in a way we're saying, yeah, we understand what you know, you know what we're doing. You know, we're not trying to destroy something. We, we, again, we honor this play. We wouldn't do it if we didn't like it already. <laughs> um, so I, I think it's, it's it, and also it's not in 3D. <laughs> Anybody ever see it in 3D? <laughs> okay, way back when or when it was re-released? Okay, so... They did it in 3D, and I uh, famously, like, the phone and the, a lamp and the scissors are in 3D, and then very quickly they got rid of the 3D. And I don't think it was seen again in 3D until the 90s or late 80s. And it's interesting to see, but it's kind of, it's a weird gimmick, right? I did not know that. It's too much of a Well, you know, when you see scissors, you know. <laughs> that is a pin spot. Um, uh, let me open it up to questions from from everybody. Yes, sir. Well, I'm not familiar with the play as a play. I mean, I just saw the movie. How much did Hitchcock change the original play? And did you toss out some of that and go back to it? Well, I'm, I'm going to repeat the question sure, just so sure, that sure. everyone can hear. So the question is, is about... Um, in Hitchcock making the movie, how much did Hitchcock change the original play and how much of those changes have gotten in or out of this adaptation? Is that fair? Yeah. So, uh, you know, do you know the term opening up a play? All right. So for those of you who don't, it means that a play that takes place in one room, you're going to film it, but now you're going to show people driving around and they're outside and that's opening up. And Hitchcock famously said, no, Everything that's really great about this play is it takes place in one room. And so with very few exceptions, it's all in one room. So I think the only thing that Hitchcock did were a few trims, uh, uh, a few cuts. Uh, uh, otherwise, I think if you were to sit with the play and the Hitchcock script, you'd say it's the same thing. Uh, we don't have the rights to the Hitchcock film. <laughs> so I think, for example, the ending is not quite the same. The dialogue is slightly different. Um, but that's simply a, you know, a question of legality. But I think <laughs> Hitchcock realized what the power of the play was. And he'd al already done that play Rope. You remember Rope? Yeah, where, yeah, with yeah. The one that he did in all in 10 minute takes. Yeah. So I think Hitchcock you know, really understood stage, the power of the stage and why screw it up. <laughs> yes, sir. No, no, you don't have time. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you think, the question is, do you think you need to see the movie to understand this production of the play? No, 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 not at all. If, if, if that were the requirement, I think the old globe would be, you know, worried about how many seats they were going to sell. Right? No, by no means, no. Yes, ma'am. Do you, do you think that they, if you want to go see the movie beforehand, is that a good or a bad idea? We would never stop you from seeing it. That just seems like a strange thing to do, right? We have uh, to borrow your phone. No. Well, you know what's interesting about that is the, uh, and I'll give you this example as my son when he was little, and they made the Harry Potter movies, and we'd go to see them and he'd say, Dobby the Elf, 
is not the same in the film as he is in the book. So I guess that's a question of when audiences so attach themselves to one version of a story that you end up feeling like like you got to do it on stage the same way, which is weird, right? Yeah, I, w I would say uh, let the let this version, uh, if you are, as you said, the Dial M for Murder Virgin and you haven't experienced it, then I would love for this to uh, be the first time you experience it versus watching something. Because one actually would say if you were really interested in the history and the evolution is that you should really read the play first. If you're interested in kind of, oh, how did it evolve? The play was the original source material that then was adapted into a screenplay by Hitchcock and that group, and now into Jeffrey. So, but no, I think, you know, I think because there are elements of murder mystery and not the who done it, but the why done it, and is the person going to find out? Let yourself kind of just be zen in the experience and be present versus trying to get ahead of the story because I saw the movie yesterday. <clears throat> Although as a dial in for murder virgin, uh, 10 o'clock tonight, you're going to be a different person entirely. <laughs> I, I remember having you know read it many times and, all, and then watching the, the run through in the rehearsal hall the first time, I totally forgot what I had read. It was just so enwrapped by, how are they going to get him? How are they going to get him? I, I couldn't remember it because I was just so absorbed in the story that it just, I, I felt like I, I couldn't access that part of my brain because I was so attentive to what was going on, which is a testament to the direction in the piece. But, um, sorry, that commentary. Um, <laughs> yes, but yes. Yeah, it it I it it there are you know cast your minds back. There was a television version, I think like 1981 with Christopher Plummer and Angie Dickinson, of all people. Um, but you know, the more you march forward into contemporary world, you know, the more certain technology mm -hmm. is, uh, it, it gets in the way of the plot, right? So if you were to do it now you know, in a world of cell phones and DNA and things like that. Just so many things don't work at all. Uh, plus, the, the love affair that's central to the play is, in 1953, a much more dangerous thing than it is in 2022. So, for all those reasons, we kept it, you know, where, where it was. Also, the clothes are awesome. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you don't want to see somebody come in in their running shorts <laughs> or a hoodie or something like that. There are some costumes in this show. His name is Ryan Park, and Ryan, uh, you know, uh, has uh, assisted and has been an associate on Broadway. This is his first time here uh, at the Old Globe, and I had worked with Ryan uh, a couple of times. And it's always fun to be able to give uh, a designer the globe experience <laughs> uh, because it's really a uh, platinum standard. Mm -hmm. Everything about this theater is uh, the way it's run, the technical crew, the administrative staff, the, the theater itself uh, is just the best. And so if we can have you know people who've not experienced that, it means a lot to give them, as I say, the globe experience. So you'll, if anyone is interested in costumes, they are really, the, the it, what's so amazing is it's even down to the buttons, right? And, and, and that, that kind of attention to detail comes from a designer, but also comes from a, a wardrobe department that excels in understanding that the artistic excellence is in the details. And even though the audience might not realize that that button is from 1950s or whatever, they uh, they will. My hair piece fell off, so <laughs> that's a costume piece, by the way. <laughs> Does anybody else have any questions? Yes, sir. Changes that you made as it evolved while you were practicing. 
Yeah. What, uh, yeah. Sorry, just sorry, to repeat. Guys. Sorry. Uh, the changes during the rehearsal process. Yeah, I think we changed I, uh, probably like four pages total out of the script, which isn't a lot, but uh, mostly in the land of clarifying things. Uh, at some point late in the show, someone says, we'll go to Peggy's blah, blah, blah. And some audience members are like, who the hell is Peggy? <laughs> uh, and in, in Knott's original, Peggy was referred to more often. So it's like, okay, so I, I got to plant Peggy earlier in the show so that people don't say, who the heck is Peggy? Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the, uh, we added something just the other day to clarify the, the murderers, the husband's thinking at a certain point. And um, I think we got lucky in the words that we found that we could choose. But it's the kind of thing that... Uh, and, and it's different from the original play, so I can't go back to something not wrote. Uh, but it's also not something that you can... Uh, you, could, uh, you could do it on camera with a huge close-up, but we don't have that. So we needed a line of dialogue to tell the audience... You know, the bad guy is plotting something. <laughs> so I would say uh, since previews, maybe six lines, something like that. You know, for uh, this is a world premiere. You know, the world premiere of this adaptation is happening here in San Diego at the Old Globe. And because it's a world premiere, what that really just means is the work is still living. And, and for the director, myself, and the actors to have... You know, we don't have Mr. Knott, but we have Mr. Hatcher. And so to be able to, to kind of make those tweaks just transcends the material from, well, this is the way it was written 60 years ago, so we have to kind of make it work. We have the a playwright here who can actually make those adjustments, not only for the narrative, but also for all of you, for the audience to kind of understand the material that much, that much better. And the, it, uh, it's an amazing job done by the both of you. It's, in, it's an incredible production. I'm so excited for you all to be able to see it. I'm so excited to be able to share it with everybody. Um, I'm going to thank everybody. we got to get in, into the theater. Um, but um, thank you to thank Jeffrey. You. Thank you to Stafford. And thank you to all of you for coming out for the Vicky and Carl Zeiger Insight Seminar.